Welcome to all of our campuses, Siena, Cyprus, downtown, Espanol, in the loop as well. It's awesome. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, basically. We're going to do a little bit of chapter 2, but the beginning parts of chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible, man, turn there in your Bible. It'd be great. Let me just tell you, too, just as we're turning our Bibles, man, how important it is that you got a Bible, that you have a Bible you turn to, that you bring it to church. I went to a, a church, and I was the only person that had a Bible. And I was like, wait a minute, did I go to the wrong thing? What was going on here? But man, I know we, we all got it on our phone. We all got it. Oh, I get it. I get it. But there's something about bringing that word of God with you. So if you don't have one, we got one right there in front of you um, at the Loop campus and different places at other campuses that you can get a Bible. It'd be our gift to you. But man, we'd love for you to have that, which would be great. Let me tell you a couple other things before we jump into to the word. We've been doing um, a thing called Interchange. So for the month of September, um, we talked about, or month of October, October, we talked about that we didn't want to be in busyness. We wanted to be in some time of solitude that we could get alone with God. Then we looked in November and we said, no more complaining. We're going to interchange that for Thanksgiving. And now we're in December and we want to kind of give away and move away from isolation and step into community. So we've been putting, so we put some ideas for you in the front of your weekly guide that you got, the welcome guide. And you can uh, look in there, some, some opportunities for that. One opportunity I want to give you of us joining Joining together, fellowshipping together is celebration that you've been hearing about. Now, when you invite somebody to celebration, you say, I want you to go to my church's Christmas thing. They're thinking, oh, town and bomb, oh, town and This is hundreds of people. This is all sorts of gear. This is like amazing, spectacular. We do the front part. It's like all the fun Christmassy stuff. And that's about 98% new since the last time we had celebration. And then we have uh, the biblical part. And it is out of this world like Broadway, just incredible things. So invite somebody, get the tickets at thefirstchristmas.org um, or our website. You can do all of that, all the ways it tells you in, in the welcome guide to get them. And man, invite people people to come. We have sold thousands and thousands and thousands of tickets, and yet we still want more people to come. It's our gift to the city to be a part of, which would just be great to know that. So let's interchange with isolation, with community, with inviting people to a gift to our city to be a part of that. Now, when you think about community and you think about connection, we're all longing for it, aren't we? Everybody wants to be a part of a team. Everybody wants work to feel like a unit together. Everybody wants family to be together. But people have no team, no family, no unit. They get involved in bad stuff, just trying to find some type of community. We're all looking for connection. We're all looking for love. We're all wanting to be a part of a family, a church family, a team at work, a family unit. And God's family, though, is the most important. And I want us to look at that in just a few moments because I just, coming off of Thanksgiving, I don't know what your Thanksgiving was like. It could have been really, really difficult or it could have been really, really awesome. Maybe a little bit of all in between. All of our family got together. We had three generations, about 14 people sitting around the, the table to eat. It was at somebody else's house, so that was good because we didn't have to bring all the food. Uh, but it was a wonderful thing to get everybody together and we would eat together. And what would happen is we'd finish the food and then we'd just stay there and laugh for like 30 or 40 minutes just talking and telling stories. And it just put in my heart this, this thought of community. And we're gonna look and see in 1 John that God has a community for us and it's the family of God. That you, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a part of a family and that's the family of God. So look in 1 John chapter two, beginning in verse 28 is where we're gonna be. Chapter two, verse 28. We're gonna hit 28 and 29 really fast, just kind of reading it through. But I want you to see 28 and 29, we're gonna move from fellowship to sonship is what's gonna happen in verse one of chapter three. So look for that. Fellowship's gonna move from fellowship to sonship. He's been talking about fellowship. Now let's look and see what it says in verse 28. So now little children remain in him, so when he appears, second coming of Christ, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So he's saying, look, when Jesus shows up, you don't want to be robbing a bank, okay, is what he's saying. And if you know that he is righteous, you know this, thing, this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So our, our born, and we're saved to serve. We're the, the ones that we've got, God's going to do something in us before he does something through us. Then verse 1. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And that's what we are. The reason that the world, 
does not know us is that he did not know him. Now, he talked about in those first couple of verses, fellowship, remaining in Christ, abiding in Christ. Then he gets to this place of sonship. I want us to say this together to the hyphen, okay? We're gonna go to the hyphen. Let's say this out loud together, all campuses. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. That's a humongous statement. In that verse of chapter two of 28 and 29, he said, I want you to remain in him. I want fellowship with him. I want you to stay close so that you'll do the right thing. And then he comes in chapter three and he says, and you are gonna be born of God. As Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he wants to be born in our hearts so that we'd be born again, that we would know Christ as Savior. So he says, I want you to know what a great love, what great love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. The first place that it begins is God's love. God's love, his great love, his love is plenty. That's the first thing I want you to get and write down. His love is plenty. So through the darkest of times, his love is enough. Through the greatest of times, his love is enough. When you're so confused about what God's will is for your life, his love is enough. When you know exactly what God wants you to do, his love is enough. When something goes wrong, it's enough. When it goes right, it's enough. When relationships are good or bad or indifferent, it's enough. Single, married, widowed, either way, it is enough. God's love is enough. It's plenty. It's kind of like Thanksgiving, you end up eating the glorious gift of God called leftovers, right? Because we cook all this food, because if 10 people are coming, you need to prepare for 15 or 20, right? Because you don't want to run out of food. I remember at Thanksgiving, we, when I was a, a college student, before I was married and just a kid in college, I'd go to my grandmother's house and she'd do some good old Cajun cooking and I would come back with, she'd call them plates, and she would make these plates, probably about 10 plates, I would take into the, put them into the freezer so I could just Thanksgiving dinner about once a week for 10 weeks in college. It was leftovers, it was awesome. And some of you are like, that's a great idea. It is a great idea. Even if you're not a college student, it's still good, it's called... Stouffer's dinner is what, it, you know, like a TV dinner is what it is. So to be able to get those plenty, the feast at Christmas, the feast at Thanksgiving, plenty. Think about the feast that will happen in heaven. You think we'll run out of food at the last supper with the lamb? No way. It's a feast that happens. It's plenty, but it doesn't stop there. It's personal. It's personal. He says, how great is the father's love, the father to a child. It's a personal love. To be a a father to a child that you love and you care for that child. Now, we can take our earthly father and project it on our heavenly father. Whether you had a good father on earth or not, it doesn't really matter. Jesus, God the Father, he is the perfect father. It's not, it doesn't say how great a love the absentee father has for us. How great a love the sergeant has. How great a love the father that was only satisfied with home runs and never took strikeouts. How great a love the the father that was a workaholic. It says how great a love the father, the perfect father in heaven, God the father. So no matter what your father was like, and I hope you had a great one, God the father loves you. And it's a personal love. It's a love that is a father to a child. It changes our identity. Remember, John's moving from fellowship to sonship. He's saying, you have been born of him is the last part of chapter two. And see what great love the father has given us that we should be called God's children. We are children of God if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your savior. Now, it comes through faith in Christ to be a child of God. We think, well, I got born on planet Earth and we're kind of all God's children. Well, the Bible talks about there's a road to destruction that's wide. There's a road that's narrow that leads to life. There's children of wrath we're actually called before we come to know Christ. That we've sinned and we're going in the wrong direction. But then children of God through faith in Jesus. See, through God's Son, we get to the Father and become the sons and daughters of God. And he changes it with a personal love. He knows you. He loves you. But it's not only plenty. It's not only personal. It's a gift. How great is the Father's love that was lavished upon us? It's a gift. Lavished and given. 
Now think about when you get a gift this Christmas. You're going to get some gifts. I hope you get some good ones. So I kind of snagged this one out from underneath our tree to be able to use it as an illustration to be able to say, okay, here's this gift. Now when someone gives this gift, it's actually a gift to me. Let's see what it is. I don't know what it is, but somehow I'm going to get this at some point. When I get this gift, I'm going to unwrap it. I'm going to savor it, but I'm not going to say, hey, you know what? Uh, let me, how much was that? Because let me, let me pay for that. Do you have any, what, what was the price tag? Now, the, the thing about being the dad is I kind of bought all the gifts, even the gifts for me in a sense, but, uh, you know, we all have different roles. So you got, you know, Kelly's working in different ways, right? But the goal is, the thing is, is not, I'm going to get a gift and I'm going to figure out how to pay for it. It's given, it's lavished, it's in love to be able to be given. And that's what God does. He gives you a gift of Jesus. He gives you a gift of a relationship with him. He gives you a gift of his direction and his guidance and his love and his counsel in your life. And so when we get it, we don't have to pay for it. Jesus already paid for it. Now, why is this important? This is so important for this reason. Please listen. We live in a world of earning love. We live in a world of earning love instead of receiving love. Well, if you're really, really pretty, you'll get a lot of attention. If you're really, really successful, everybody will give you a lot of respect. If you do it right, then people will praise it. If you do it wrong, people are going to be upset about it. And so we are living in this achievatron society that when we achieve, then we receive. And Jesus Christ is saying, when you receive, then you'll actually achieve the great things for me that I want you to do. And so I just want to break the box for us for just a moment and to realize in our hearts that he's lavished his love upon you. You will not do everything right. I will not do everything right. Every situation will not go well. Every situation will not go right. It's just not gonna happen. It's not perfect on planet earth. But yet we can say, Lord, even in the midst of those things, your love has been lavished upon us and it's a gift. Are you spending your life trying to earn, trying to earn others' love, trying to earn others' approval? And Jesus is saying, I've lavished and I've given you a gift. See, these things are so important, particularly when you don't know what's going on in your life. When the orientation of your life is just discombobulated, it just doesn't make sense. You can hang on to, I'm a child of God. He's given me his love. When you don't understand what's going on, you're going through difficult times and it feels like the Red Sea's about to cave in on you. I'm a child of God. His love is with me. I don't have to earn it. I can never lose it. I, I've, I'm, I'm in his hand. That's what it means to be a child of God. And what happens then is God's love changes our primary identity. So our primary identity is God's love. It's being a child of God. That's your primary identity. So when we think about this earning, we get the wrong primary identity. Your primary identity isn't being pretty. Your primary identity isn't being successful. My primary identity is not being a pastor or a parent or a spouse. My primary identity and your primary identity is being a child of God. And when you receive Christ as your Savior and you say, my primary identity, and now I'm a Christian that happens to be a lawyer, not a lawyer that happens to be a Christian. I'm a Christian that happens to be a plumber or happens to be a mom or happens to be a dad or happens to be a single adult, not the other way around. But we get so confused in that, so confused in that. And he's saying, I want my love to be so core in your life that your primary identity through the greatest of times, the worst of times, through the most successful, through the biggest of this and the biggest of that, the worst of it, whatever it is. I want, my pri I want your primary identity to be that you are my child. And when our primary identity becomes that we are his child, everything shifts. Everything shifts. I've been enjoying watching football. You've probably been enjoying watching football. It's awesome to watch football this time of year. It's been great. Some great games happening. Some really long games happening. Um, so watching all that's been great. It's been incredible. But I watched a, a football game just recently. And one of the players got injured and they brought him back to the, to the sidelines and he was sitting on the sidelines and he wasn't going to be able to go in for the rest of the game. And he sat on the sidelines and the TV camera zoomed in on this private moment he was having in this college player who's probably going to play in the NFL, sat there and he cried. It's like this. Somebody came up and patted his shoulder and tears were running down his face and you're watching this big, you know, those, those guys are so aggressive and so tough and just so, ah, kind of people. 
And then you're watching him cry because he's not going back in the game. Now, I don't know him. I don't know if he's got to walk with the Lord or anything. I just want to use that as an illustration. What do you do when your whole life has been about sports and it's not about sports anymore? What if your whole identity is about being an athlete on that college team and you get hurt? Everything just is a mess at that point. What takes place? But when your primary identity is being a child of God, now you're able to say, and I know tears right there. I'm not trying to push somebody along too quick. But you're able to say, Lord, I can trust in your sovereignty. I can trust in who I am in you. And you, Lord, can take me through this injury. You can take me through this, this downturn. You can take me through this whatever it is. And I can trust you that you're working all things out for your good. Do you see the difference? And that comes from the love of God, plenty in your life, lavished upon you so that your primary identity is the gift that you've received. It's not just doing stuff to earn it. It's what God can do in you. But there's a downside. The downside is the end of of verse one of chapter three. Look at it. It says this. It says, but the world doesn't know you because it didn't know him. So it's basically saying this. When you follow Christ, it said in the gospels that they didn't know Christ. They didn't understand what Christ was doing. Actually got crucified for living a righteous life. So he's saying there's a downside of this, of what's taking place. The downside is you're going to be seen as different. How do you feel about that? Students, how do you feel about being different? Being a little bit different because, you know, here's what's going to happen. When you begin to say, you know what, I read a 2,000-year-old book. It's a little different. My views on life are a little different. My heart for the things of sacrifice are a little bit different. I think a mission trip is something that's amazing, not just a vacation. It's a little bit different. I think about marriage a little bit different. Single adults to be able to say, I'm gonna wait until marriage. It's a little bit different. I'm not gonna click on those sites. I'm not gonna go in those ways. I'm not gonna do in those places. It's a little bit different when all of a sudden this happens. When you find joy in grief, when you find joy in trial, all of those things, then it becomes a little bit different and the world will look and they'll say, what are you doing? Why don't you give up on God, Job? What are you thinking? And yet he says, we're gonna be different and they're not gonna know you because they didn't know him. And so students, I just call out to you, I know it's so hard to be a kid nowadays, be different. Be different. Minister to people in a great way, but just be different. And what we've done is we've gotten so close to sin, we're trying to say, I don't want to be weird though. I'm not calling you to be weird, I promise you. I'm just saying be different. Don't try to get as close to sin as you possibly can to try to say, okay, look, I'm just like you, I'm just like you. Instead say, no, I'm not just like you. I've actually got joy in my heart. I've got something different in my soul. Lord is doing something in me. There is something different about what's happening. And when that happens, then you walk as a different person. So students, choose your Friday night friends carefully as I say. And you know what can be great? Your family can be your Friday night friends. That's a blessing. Just being home with your folks, that's awesome. They'll buy you all sorts of food that your friends won't buy you to just have you home with them. It'd be great. Be different and let God do something different in your life. Be different. This morning, sometimes I I wake up and, well, all the time I wake up. Hopefully I continue to wake up. (laughs) But sometimes when I wake up on Sunday morning, I think, you know, I didn't need to get my blood pumping. Sunday's a big day. There's a lot of energy for me on Sunday, a lot of connection, a lot of relationships, a lot of talking, all that sort of stuff. And so on Sunday, I I woke up this morning. I thought, you know, as I do on other Sundays, I'm going to go for a little run in the neighborhood and just kind of get my blood flowing. Now, don't get over impressed. I'm not running like six miles. I'm not like training for a marathon. Don't be like, wow, you're such a fit, good athlete. I'm a frail, small man, okay, is what I am. (laughs) There's, there's, no, there's no team that ever could have not done without me, ever, okay? I'm like, okay, are we going to pick him or him? Well, me, okay. And then I still don't get picked, okay? So, I, so it's okay. I'm, I'm okay. I, I had to work on my personality, you know? It's just, just how it worked out. 
So this morning I got up and I thought I just need to run a little bit. I just need to kind of get my blood uh, flowing. It's a a pretty day. So I I got my phone in my hand. I couldn't find my headphones. So I just got my phone in my hand and I turned on a song that um, uh, I'll read to you in in just a a bit. And I turned on this song and I'm running and I'm going and I'm playing this song. And it's a song I tell you, it's, it's by Chris Tomlin called Home. And so it's just talking about heaven, which we'll get to in just a second. And I'm running with this song playing and I'm having a great time and didn't go very long, just, you know, as I said, and I'm coming, but as I'm heading back to my house, I'm all of a sudden now my arms are up and I'm like running through the neighborhood like, yeah, it's going to be a great day. And I start thinking, what are my neighbors thinking now at this moment? (laughs) Here's a guy running in the neighborhood like he thinks he's Rocky, you know, at five, seven. I mean, what's the deal here? So he's running along. So I'm like, this is weird. And so I kind of put my arms down and nobody's looking in the neighborhood. Nothing's happening like that. But then I was like, wait a minute, let me be an arms up kind of guy so that they could say, well, maybe he's different. What's going on? We're sleepy on Sunday morning. He's praising God on Sunday morning. I don't think anybody's going to come to Christ because I'm running around the neighborhood with my arms up. That's a little weird. Okay. If I keep doing that, I understand that. But what I'm saying is when something gets in your heart, it's going to make you different. And I'm asking you a question as human to human. Are you okay with that? Because if you're not, it's gonna limit your spiritual growth. Because you're always gonna be trying to figure out how to get God into your box instead of letting God break your box. And that's what he says in that verse. He says, you're a child of God. That's what we are. The world, uh, the reason the world does not know us is it did not know him. Now look at verse two and three. Dear friends, we are God's children now. You see, he's getting a point across. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, second coming of Christ, we will be like him. Believers' bodies, our bodies will change a resurrected body in heaven, but we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Listen to that. Everyone who has this hope, what's that hope? The hope of heaven. In him purifies himself just as he is pure. Here's my point. The more we long for heaven, the more we live for him on earth. The more we long for heaven the more we live for him on earth. And I'm afraid that some of us are like, oh, no, 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 heaven, I do not want it, do not, uh, uh, uh." I mean, way, 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 way. Don't get so enamored with earth that you forget how great heaven is. Our friends and our family and our loved ones that are in heaven right now would not come back. Not because they don't love us, but because they are in heaven with Jesus. Their child of God, their true identity is now happened. It's face to face, it's right there. So then we on this side can grieve with hope because we know that we're gonna be there one day and we're gonna see them as well. The more we long for heaven, the more, the more we live for him on earth. Chris Tomlin's song, I'm going home where the streets are golden, where every chain is broken. Oh, I wanna go, oh, I wanna go. I wanna go home where every fear is gone. I'm in your open arms. Can you see me running through the neighborhood at this point? Where I belong, home, lay down my burdens. I lay down my past. I run to Jesus, no turning back. Thank God Almighty, I'll be free at last in heaven, in heaven. Blinded eyes will finally see. The dead will rise on the shores of eternity. The trump will sound, the trumpet will sound. The angels will sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm going home. And he says, he says there, you're going to see him. Jesus is returning. He's come once in Bethlehem. He's coming next in the sky. And when he comes, and when we think about him coming, and we think about heaven, there's a purification that happens in our heart because now I want to walk with him. And so if it makes me a little different, that's worth it. That's fine. I want to walk with him and let God do something in me. Home. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Just this week, you saw the news reports. We lost a great man in our country of George Bush, President Bush. doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. That's not the point. But to know a great man that served our country for decades and decades of his life and his family and all of that, and for him stepping out uh, in all the ways that he did to serve, and then now stepping off of planet Earth into heaven. And so we all saw that. We, we knew it was coming because Barbara dying, and then knew that would probably be soon with him. 
But James Baker came to visit him just this past week and went into the room where President Bush was. And President Bush was sitting up and had every kind of his faculties all together. And James Baker walked in, who they had served together for a long, long time. And he said, Bake, where are we going? And James Baker responded, he said, Hefe, Hefe, meaning boss in Spanish, Hefe, we're going to heaven. And George Bush responded, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to go. It's a touching thing to think about former president saying that. Here he's saying, 1 John's saying, if we'll get our eyes on heaven, God will do something in us in earth. And there'll be a love of the Father, that that love of the Father that will say, I'm a child of God, and when I don't know what to do, I'm going to trust in you because one day I'm going to be with you in heaven, and I'm going to trust in you, God, on planet earth. I put down for you seven things about what our glorified body, our resurrected body will be like in heaven. Just some different things because people ask those questions all the time. Just give me a list, not a whole sermon on it. You can read that for yourself. But to be able to understand and to know that God's got a plan for us. And so what we've got to do is this, to realize through faith in Jesus Christ, we've become children of God. And that's a personal love, and that's a plenty love, and that's a love that changes our primary identity. But you know what? When you change your primary identity, you're going to look a little different to the rest of the world. And to be okay with that, to know that there's something deeper happening. And as we long for heaven, it makes us more effective and makes us more in love with Him on earth so that we can say we want to go home. And I get concerned sometimes that we got so many things that are just five steps and five tips on how to live a better life on earth. And that's good, and that's well, and I've preached those sermons before, and I'll preach them again. But let's don't forget that this is not our home and that the true home is in heaven and it comes through Jesus Christ as our Savior. There's a heavenly hope that purifies our lives. God doesn't use his love to approve our sin. He uses that to pull us out of our sin. And Jesus was that substitute that takes us to heaven. Let me give you one last illustration and we'll be finished. President Lincoln in Pennsylvania, there is buried a grave of a Civil War soldier that is buried. The stone on the the headstone has the date of his birth and the date of the Civil War soldier's death, but it says this on the headstone, Abraham Lincoln's substitute. Abraham Lincoln's substitute. In the woe and the anguish of the Civil War, Abraham realized that thousands upon thousands were falling and dying in his place on the battlefield. So Lincoln chose to honor one particular soldier to be his substitute and to make him as a symbol, as it were, to the fact that soldiers were perishing in the battle, were dying so that other people could live. Now, what's happening with our soldiers? They're going on our behalf. They paid their price so that, or of their lives so that we could live. And so Abraham Lincoln in, in Pennsylvania, there's a tombstone that says, Abraham Lincoln substitute. And let me tell you what would be written on the stone that was rolled away. Greg's substitute, Jesus Christ. Written on the cross, maybe I should better say. Greg's substitute, he died on the cross for me. Your substitute, put your name in there. He died on the cross for you. Why? So you could just be a nice person? So that you could be a child of God. He came as a child to make us a child of God. He came in Bethlehem because he's coming in the clouds. God has a plentiful love for me and you. So that somebody could say, where are we going? We're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. And we could have that community and that family, and maybe your family's in a bad spot right now. You have a family of church family and a family of God. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, He's your Father. You're His child. His love is enough. If you haven't, here's the gift. The gift in the manger. Here's the gift. Receive it and let Jesus change your life. Father, we come... We thank you, Lord, that we are children of yours, that you, God, are amazing and great, worthy of praise. You are hope. We pray, Father, that we would just sense the lavishness of your love. Sometimes that's hard for us, God. 
We see earth before we see heaven. And I pray, Father, in every campus, every place, even on the internet, Lord, the radio ministry, whatever it is, that if there's anyone that has never trusted in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be their Savior, to be their forgiveness, to be their grace, that they would know that's the bridge to heaven. To become a child, it's to receive God's Son. And they would receive and put their trust and faith that you were our substitute, God. For those of us that are believers already, may we run through our neighborhoods with our arms up in praise. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Saying, Lord, thank you. Heaven's real. Heaven's true. I long for you, God. Thank you. Pray if you would just to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to take a step today with you. For some that may be a step of salvation. Say, I want to trust you, Jesus, as my Savior. I want to know you. There's a step of growth that maybe to, to plant your life here in our church, to be baptized, to just walk in greater obedience. Jesus' name.